Hello, everybody. Nice to see a full house. I already feel the love. I need my first slide. Okay, so what I try to do today, I'll give you a little um, outline on the kind of things I want to discuss today. I really want to start with the basic finding, the discovery of these cells in the monkey brain and then also in the human brain. And I'm going to focus on these recordings done with electrodes in the depth of the brain because I think those are the most compelling data that neuroscience can provide today about the inner workings of the brain. But then the point is, we have these cells in the brain and what do we do with them? The argument we're going to make is that, first of all, we use these cells automatically in a very effortless way to understand what's going on in the minds of others. And that leads to what I think is one of the most uh, beautiful achievements of the human mind, which is empathy, the ability to understand the mental states of others, the emotions of others, and to help others. Then I want to conclude the talk talking about applications, because I think that the discovery itself is really nice. It's actually beautiful. It's a great achievement of the human capacity to understand um, what's going on in the brain. But I think that the, the vision of this research is that what we want to do is to use this finding to actually improve empathy and also to use it for mental health, for learning. And you'll see there are many different applications that can be used um, of, of, uh, regarding this discovery. And finally, because this is a, kind of an unusual conference for me, I tend to go to conferences in which there are plenty of brain scientists. And here we have poets, we have uh, historians, we have all sorts of scholars. We have artists too. I also want to make the point that, in fact, this discovery can actually foster collaboration between scientists and non-scientists, even artists. Okay, the first thing I want to show you is a little video. You'll see a monkey, the monkey's in the lab, the monkey grasps something. And every time the monkey grasps, you'll hear some kind of a static sound. That's the uh, sound that it uh, represents the firing of a cell. So there's a neuron that fires every time the monkey grasps. The monkey has an electrode implanted in the brain, and the electrode is recording the activity of the neuron. And you'll see that every time the monkey grasps, the cell fires. So you can see that every time the monkey grasps a piece of food, there is this discharge of the cell. The cell is in the part of the brain of the monkey that controls the body of the monkey. So it makes sense that this cell fires when the monkey grasps. But then the unexpected finding, something that neuroscientists never thought they could find in the brain, is that the same cell also fires when the monkey is completely still and is simply watching somebody else making the same action. That's the mirror phenomenon. It's like as if the monkey, just by watching somebody else making the action, is, uh, is seeing their own action reflected by a mirror. In English, there's this say, monkey see, monkey do, and this is clearly a monkey see, monkey do cell. Now, this was the unexpected finding when the scientists discovered this thing. Initially, they were in complete disbelief. They thought this must be an artifact of some sort. We, are, we must be doing something wrong. This can't be real. But I guess the beauty of science is that you can actually recheck what you have done, what you have seen. And eventually, it's a if, if you have a phenomenon that is reproducible, then you have to start to believe that that's a real phenomenon. Now, mirror is a powerful word. In fact, I mean, you can find the word mirror and uh, the metaphor of mirrors in also, in, in, I would say, in every culture. And it captures well this notion that, you know, it, basically the cell acti is active when I, when I grasp a cup of coffee, when I see you doing the same thing. But on the end, it could be a little misleading. These cells can do even more than that. I'm going to show you another video in which now the, the, the monkey is watching the human in front of her, and the human is putting a piece of food in his mouth, and the cell fires again. Leo Fogassi is very pleased. Being an Italian, dealing with food is always something good for him. 
In the next uh, little clip, I'm going to show you that w what the human does in front of the monkey is to put a syringe in his mouth and the cell files. Why is that? Well, monkeys that live in the lab, they get rewarded for the kind of tasks they do in the lab with juice that they really like. And they drink the juice through a syringe. So almost like the syringe in this case would be like a glass. Um, then the, what the human, uh, what Leo Fogassi does is that it, it makes the same action, but rather than putting the syringe in his mouth, it, it kind of deviates at the end, and the syringe doesn't go to the mouth. The cell doesn't fire. This suggests that these cells really seem to be coding the goal of the action that the monkey is observing. The monkey is trying to grab the thing. Um, that's actually interesting because, in fact, it's a, in, in a couple of seconds, there is a, a nice neuroscience uh, um, uh, lesson there. The human brain, and, or the primate brain in general, divides its working when it comes to reaching and grasping. Reaching is about space. Grasping is about the property of the object and the way you have to shape your fingers around the object. Uh, the last clip I'm going to show you doesn't teach us anything new respect to, with respect to the other ones that we've seen so far, but I think it captures nicely this idea of sharing that mirror neurons have. Leo Fogas is going to put a piece of food in his mouth, he doesn't eat it, the cell fires, then he offers it to the monkey, the monkey grasps it with a hand and the cell fires again. Okay, these are very compelling videos, but you tend not to publish these things in scientific journals. What you publish are this kind of data. Um, I'll tell you what they are. These are called, we call these things rasters, and every line represents one trial, and every little dot represents the action potential, the firing of the cell. And this one at the bottom, we call them histograms, and represent the fire rate change of the cell, that is, how much it fires over time. Clearly, what you see on this side of the slide is the basic phenomenon, the mirroring. Now, one thing that we have to check, I mean, there are many different controls conditions that you have to do when you do science. Um, one thing that you have to check is that whether these responses of the cell are driven just by seeing something. And that's not the case. In fact, when the monkey also grasps here um, in, uh, in darkness, at the bottom of the, of the slide, there is still firing. And the other interesting thing is that what happens in this situation is that the cell does not fire when the monkey is watching somebody else grasping uh, something with a tool. Why is that? Because monkeys do not use tools. And so the, the idea of all these things combined, uh, the initial hypothesis was that, well, this is a matching system. I have some things in my brain that represent my motor repertoire all the actions I can do. And whenever I see you doing similar actions, the same cells in my brain fire up. By doing that, I understand what's going on in your mind. What is it that you want to accomplish? Another thing that was found right away is that monkeys do not pantomime. Humans do that. We can, we can pantomime a grasp, even though there is nothing to be grasped. And in fact, these cells do not fire at the site of the pantomime because, again, the matching phenomenon doesn't occur. But that gave also an idea for another experiment, and that's what I want to talk about now. So here the idea is the following. Let, let me repeat the basic thing. The monkey is watching somebody else grasping, and the grasping cell in the monkey brain fires. But when there is nothing to be grasped and the human makes only a pantomime in front of the monkey, the cell doesn't get too excited. Now, what happens if the monkey sees there is something to be grasped and then a screen slides in such that it occludes the sight of the object? This is something that happens to us every time. We go in, about in life and we see other people making actions but oftentimes we can't see the whole action because there are other people that occlude our sight or there is an object or there is a wall and yet we are able to understand what other individuals are doing. So here the idea is if the monkey can't see the completion of the grasping action, does the cell fire? And the answer is yes.
So even though the grass pinat is occluded, yet there is firing of the cell. Now the control condition is that the monkey sees there is a table, there's nothing to be grasped behind the table, uh, on the table. And then the, uh, the screen slides in and the human goes behind uh, the screen. Will the cell fire or not? The cell is much less excited by this situation. Now, it's interesting that these two conditions are, the one at the bottom, they are visually identical. The only difference is that the monkey, it's the prior knowledge of the fact that there is something to be grasped behind the screen. And these are the data published in the original paper we chose in doing. And so you can see that there is firing of the cell when, uh, on this side, when there is a full grasping action inside, but not when there is a pantomime. And then there is firing in that situation when the monkey knows that there is something to be grasped, but not when the monkey knows that there is nothing to be grasped. This is a fairly uh, sophisticated coding of the actions of others, because the only difference is really the prior knowledge about something to be grasped behind uh, the screen. This suggests that these cells can also code for hidden actions, in a way. Um, the other thing that we, when we make actions and we go around, you know, in, in life, sometimes our actions produce some sounds. When you break a peanut, there is a characteristic sound uh, that is associated with it. And you have your, probably your, your common experience when you are either in the house or at the office and you hear footsteps, you can recognize different kinds of footsteps, different kinds of people just by the sound of the way they talk, they, they walk. So now I'm going to show you a little video in which you're going to hear a, a cell that fires when the monkey just hears the sound of breaking a peanut. And then when the monkey sees somebody breaking a peanut silently with no sound. And finally also when the monkey sees both the action and hears the sound of the action. And again, these are the histograms of raster. The key important aspect of, of this is that, first of all, these cells are, we call them multimodal. What does that mean? It means that they respond to both sight and also uh, sound. That's important because it, we believe that this is exactly the way the brain creates complex concepts by blending different kinds of information. And these cells embody, in just one cell, you can find responses that are related to a complex phenomenon, which is, you know, an action of somebody else, and can be coded in many different ways using different um, aspects of the action. Okay, so far I've shown you mostly hand actions, but uh, we also know that there are mirror neurons for mouth actions. That's very important, especially when it comes to the argument I'm going to make later that this system is important for empathy because we show our emotion mostly with our face. This is the work of my friend Pierre Ferrari that showed that uh, there are different kinds of uh, um, ingestive actions uh, like biting a banana or uh, drinking from a syringe, but also communicative actions like lip smacking, which is a facial gesture in the monkey world that is uh, of positive balance. So for all these things, there are mirroring responses in the brain. But then the question is, okay, we make a lot of actions in our life, but our actions are actually associated with specific intentions. So the question is, do these cells, the mirror cells, care about the action or even about the intention associated with the action. I can make the same action with different intention. I can grasp a cup, of, a cup of coffee because I want to drink the coffee or because I want to clean up the table and put the, the cup of coffee in the dishwasher. So this was a complex experiment that was done again in monkeys. The setup is such that the monkey is just uh, waiting for the screen to go down and then to grab a piece of food. And then the monkey can do three things with the food. Eat it put it in a container, or put it in a container close to her mouth. Now, how do you teach a monkey to grab a piece of food and not eat it? That's the difficult part of this experiment. 
And the way you do it is that monkeys, as humans, have food preference. They like some foods more than others. So if the monkey actually is able to control herself and put the piece of food in the container, it gets rewarded with a better food. So that's, what, that's the way the experiment is done. When you do that, you find three different kinds of cells. When the monkey is just making the actions, on this side, on the, on the left side, what's called unit 158, you have a cell that really doesn't care whenever the monkey grasps the cell fires. That's a grasping cell. It doesn't really care about the intention. But then these other two cells on this side, one, the one on the left side, clearly fires much more when the monkey grasps to it. Now, the firing of the cell happens at the time of grasping. So when the monkey grasps, we don't know what's going to happen next. But if we are able to actually read what's the behavior of this, this you know, we can make a prediction about what the monkey will be doing next. So in a way, the firing of these cells predicts the future behavior of the monkey. And clearly, this is compelling evidence that these cells are coding not the grasping action, but the intention associated with it. So this is the moral behavior of these cells. What about the mirror responses? Well, same story. So the cells that... Uh, care only about grasping, will mirror grasping, no matter what. But the cells that code specifically the intention to eat or the intention to place the food in the container, well, those cells will also mirror that intention specifically. So this is really compelling evidence that this system is really important, not just for coding actions and in, in superficial way, but for really coding what is the deepest motivation behind our own action, the intention associated with them. Okay, for many years we had data on this system in the brain of the monkey only from two brain regions. The original one was area F5 uh, over there. Um, this is a schematic of the monkey brain um, and on that side is the front of the brain and on that side is the back of the brain. We also knew about these cells in an area of, in, the, in the back of the brain called PFG. But in the last five years, many different labs have reported many other kinds of mirroring responses. So for many years, we knew about this grasping action and these hand, uh, hand actions and also these mouth actions. And now we know that there are mirror cells for reaching, there are mirror cells for eye movements, there are mirror cells for defensive movements. So it seems that I call this phenomenon that it's happening in the neuroscience literature expanding the mirror. There are many more regions of the brain that contain these cells. They're well documented. And there are many different kinds of actions that are mirrored. But so far, I've shown only data from the monkey brain. What about the human brain? Well, first of all, let, let me make an argument. The reason why we do research in the monkey brain is because it is easier to do the research, because recordings in the depth of the brain are very invasive, and because we believe that the data you collect in the monkey brain have an inferential role for understanding what's going on in the human brain. This is why we do this research. So clearly, and, and there are many arguments why this is valid, I mean, the evolutionary argument in particular. But it's always nice when you are able to get data from the human brain, except that you can't really do brain surgery just out of scientific curiosity. But in some situations, because of medical um, reasons, science can kind of piggyback on the medical procedure and uh, collect incredible data um, in the human brain. A procedure that is done in many different places all over the world is the following. Patients with epilepsy, in some cases, the, meds, the, the medicines do not control the disease. The patients will seize anyway, even uh, under uh, medication. So in these patients, it's very useful if the surgeon can actually locate the, um, the focus of epilepsy and remove it surgically. But of course, if you want to do that, what you want to do is only to remove the pathological tissue. You don't want to remove the healthy tissue surrounding it. And how do you find out where is the pathological tissue? Well, a procedure that is done is the following. The patients get implanted with depth electrodes in the brain and uh, they, they get hospitalized, of course. Um, the, the doctor removes the drugs, so the, the, the patient doesn't have drugs anymore. At some point, the patient will seize. And when the patient seizes, 
with all these electrodes implanted in the depth of the brain, the surgeon knows exactly where is the location of the focus of epilepsy and can remove only the pathological tissue. So this is just the medical procedure. What we did at UCLA, and to do this, you need really these really big electrodes that record only the electroencephalographic signal, which, which you need for your medical procedure. But we modified the electrodes, and we put some microwires on the tip of the electron, and we were able to record individual cells from the human brain. These patients are in the hospital, and then they're not doing much. They're just waiting for a seizure to happen. Um, and so they are really and actually happy to do experiments. Um, and we recorded uh, in a series of the last more than three years a number of cells from the human brain, which I think is the coolest kind of data I've always uh, be part of. Um, so we were recording mostly from the frontal lobe on top and also from a region of the brain which is called the medial temporal lobe. That's a region of the brain that is, we know it's important for vision, so especially high-level vision, and for memory. If, if I remove that part of the, uh, of the brain from your brain, you will be forgetful. You will not be able to remember things. And, of course, I was expecting to find these mirror cells mostly in the frontal lobe because the frontal lobe is the part of the brain associated with actions. And we know that mirror cells really care about actions. I had this really bright um, postdoc, Roy Mukama. He's now a professor back in Israel, in Tel Aviv University. And, of course, we found mirror cells of all different kinds. We found even a really interesting type of mirror cells, which is the one that I'm highlighted here, these cells, this type of cell fires up, that is, increases the fire rate when the patient is making the action, but also by, when the patient is observing the action, it actually shuts itself down. It completely silences uh, its activity. And we think there is a very interesting uh, way for uh, the brain to control, on one hand, unwanted imitation, but also to differentiate between self and other. Because if my neurons activate whenever I make an action, and whenever I see you making an action, then the problem is who's doing the action. We need to have that kind of information. And within this type of mirror cells uh, provides that kind of information. But one day, I vividly remember, Roy comes to my office, shows me some of this data, and asks me, so what do you think of this cell? I say, well, it's a beautiful mirror cell. You have active when, when the patient is making the action, when he's observing the action, silent for all the control condition. It's great. Where is it? And he tells me it's in the entorhinal cortex, which is a tiny part of the medial temporal lobe. The region of the brain that I told you is important for memory and for... I look at Roy and I tell him, Roy, are you drunk? <laughs> How can you say it's in the medial temporal lobe? Don't you see? It's a motor cell. And uh, we know that the medial temporal lobe really doesn't have motor properties. He looks at me and says, what can I tell you? It's there. I still didn't believe him. I told him, well, you know, I believe you guys must have mislabeled the electrodes. Why don't you go back and check? He comes back to me and says, oh, I don't think we made any mistake. I still didn't believe uh, Roy. I, told him, I thought, well, they made a mistake, but they can't trace it back. And so because they can't trace it back, he believes that these data are real. But who cares? After all, we're not going to see this thing ever again. And then patient after patient after patient, we found mirror cells in the medial temporal lobe. And eventually, I had to change my mind. I think that's one of the most beautiful aspects of science. There aren't many human activities in which people, if their beliefs are actually contradicted by facts, are able to and willing to change their mind. But scientists, that's what exactly what they do. And so we have to deal with this notion that we have mirror cells also in the medial temporal lobe. And the question is, why is that? I mean, when you have an unexpected finding, then you have to figure out a way to understand the phenomenon. And so what we think it happens here is that when I grasp a, a glass, I'm making the, the action. I have my motor cells that, you know, fire up to make, to, to, to control my muscles. I have all my, you know, uh, rewarding cells that will code the reward of drinking. But then I also have the part of my brain that uh, encode memory that will remember, will uh, kind of uh, record the trace of myself making the action. That's part of, you know, the, the recording of my own life. When I see you making the action, the same phenomenon happens. I mirror not only your motor plans, but I even mirror the memory aspect of it. That is, I see you grasping a cup, 
of coffee, say, and my, my uh, memory, uh, the brain region that control memory in my brain reactivate the, motor, the, the memory trace of myself grasping a cup of coffee. So the mirroring is really a rich, very rich mirroring of the actions of others. Okay, so this slide only, I don't want to go through the list of the things that are on the slide, but the whole point of the slide is that now we know for sure that there are at least six or seven neural systems that code different kinds of actions with different mechanisms, and that have this mirroring phenomenon. And so now the whole concept of mirroring really tends to expand. And we have to ask ourselves, what's a mirror neuron? We, the definition we have currently is the following. The critical feature of mirror neurons is the functional matching between the modal response to our own actions and the perceptual response to the actions of others. Now, the aspect of the action that is mirror really depends on where the mirror cell is located. If it's in a part of the brain that codes the goal of the action, it's about the goal. If it's in a part of the brain that controls eye movements and attention, it's about attention. And if it's in a part of the brain that is relevant to memory, then it's the memory aspect of the action that gets mirrored. But altogether, this tells us two things. First of all, that this phenomenon is much more widespread in the brain than we were thought of, and also that it provides a very powerful mechanism for understanding what's going on in the minds of others by just perceiving what they do. And speaking of perception, this also leads to this notion that this phenomenon is very automatic. It's something that, you know, if it works well, we don't have to make an effort to actually get this thing running and make us understand what's going on in the minds of others. So when we see an action, this is a video that some collaborators of mine in Germany made. We see a guy grasping something, we understand and we feel that there is an intention behind it. But the whole notion is that if this stuff is really so automatic, then we have some sort of little side effects. And, you know, I'm going to show you a little video of a robot grasping something. And I don't know you, but certainly every time I see this video, I have the perception and the feeling that there is an intention behind the action, even though that's a robot. And so I know that there can't be an intention. But from the standpoint of perceiving it, perceiving that, that action, it feels like there is an intention behind it. And this really suggests that, in fact, this, this kind of machinery that we have in the brain is fairly automatic. That doesn't mean that we can't control it. And, in fact, I'm going to end this lecture uh, by advocating the fact that what we want to do is to try to control it, to suppress it in, in some cases, and to improve it in some other cases. But the point is, is that this stuff in the brain really uh, uh, codes the, the body language of people and makes us understand the mental states of others by reading out the body language. And we start doing this very early on. Andy Melzer, which is a friend of mine, has done this work many, many years ago showing that infants that are very, very young, the youngest infant that he um, studied was 42 minutes old when he, for the first time, imitated. The whole life of the baby was filmed. He had never made the action before. And when May, uh, Andy was sticking out his tongue, the baby did the same thing. So we, we have this, right off the bat in life, we have this capacity to imitate others. And that's, we think, the, the, the basic phenomenon that on which we build much more than that. My lab has been pretty um, active using brain imaging to study imitation in the human brain and figure out which system in the brain are relevant to imitation. I'm going to tell you just very briefly in basically one slide that we believe there is a core circuitry of imitation composed by three major uh, centers. And this core circuitry interacts with other neural systems to um, really provide a very flexible uh, and competent social behavior. Imitation is important for many different things. It's important for learning. You look at people doing things and you learn by imitation. It's important for transmission of culture. The, the reason why I speak the way I speak and they were the, the, the reason why I gesture the way I gesture is because my Italian heritage is always with me. And it's, it's been with me since the get-go and I can't, it basically, I was looking at my compatriots, people around me, and I was absorbing all these things. But the point is that why do we need to do this? And why would we actually have this propensity to do this? Again, the idea is that we use imitation and mirror cells to understand the minds of others. 
when it comes to empathy in particular, there's one part of the body that is especially important. It's not the whole body is important, but it's one part of the body is especially important, and that's the face. And I found a beautiful quote from a famous philosopher, Ludwig Wittgenstein, and the quote says, we see emotion as opposed to what? We do not see facial contortions and make the inference that is feeling joy, grief, boredom. We describe the face immediately as sad, radiant, bored, even when we are unable to provide any other description of the feature. This is a beautiful description and uh, written about 40 years before mirror neurons were discovered of exactly what's the mirroring mechanism, an immediate perception of the facial gestures of others that give us an idea of what's the emotion behind the gesture. There are also well, this, you know, nice insight from a philosopher. There are well-controlled experiments in the lab that show strong links between imitation and empathy. Humans tend to imitate all the time. You do it in social situations, you do it all the time. You do it automatically, unconsciously, you're not even aware of it, but you do it. These things can be filmed during social interactions, and then what you can do is to quantify the, the propensity to imitate that people have. Some people tend to be more imitators than others. And there's a phenomenon in social psychology called the chameleon effect. The chameleon effect tells us exactly this, that humans have this propensity to imitate. But there is a beautiful study that clearly shows that the more you tend to imitate, the more you tend to be empathic, the more you tend to care about the uh, emotional states of others. We wanted to capture this with a very simple visual, and we found two pictures of President Carter way back then that I'm going to show you now. He's giving a talk, and behind him there is the chief of his staff, and then later on in the talk. So we do this all the time. We're not even aware of it. It's something that we, we tend to do it. But again, because there is this link within the, the tendency to imitate others, and the tendency to empathize, I thought, well, how does it work in terms of brain system? Because that's, you know, that's my day job. I, I'm, a neuro, I'm a systems neuroscientist, and I try to understand how the brain implements behavior by looking at how neural systems talk to each other. So we have this model. I, I wrote this brief paper a few years ago in which we propose that there is this core imitation circuitry. And, you know, imitated behavior is very complex. I mean, you can actually describe it in so many different forms and ways, uh, creating very detailed taxonomies of imitated behavior. But it seems to me that the bottom line is that it boils down to two main kinds of imitation forms. A cognitive form that we use for learning and a, an emotional form that we use to connect with others. Um, and also, when, I, when I talk about social mirroring, that's exactly what I'm talking about, this emotional form of imitation. And so I posited that, you know, what happens in the brain when we have this social mirroring is that our mirror neurons interact with our emotional brain centers so that we have this feeling of connection with others. We propose a very simple model. You see a smiling face, and what your mirror neurons do, they fire up. And they create what we call a simulation, or I call it also inner imitation, an imitation that is not overt, it's not out in your body, but it's just inside your head. You're imitating that facial expression, and then your mirror neurons send signals to your emotional brain centers, and by doing that, they evoke the feeling associated with that face. And in, in that way, you understand immediately what's going on in the, uh, in the mind of the person you're looking at. We did a study in 2003 using brain imaging, and we demonstrated that in terms of brain activity, but there was one piece, one piece of the puzzle that was missing, that is the behavior. How does the activity in the brain um, correlate with behavior? And so we did a follow-up study. This is actually part of a much larger study. That's my daughter. She was nine at that time, and she was proud and happy to pose for her dad in front of a, an, an MRI scanner. Now she's 16, and she would never do that. <laughs> so the kids are imitating or observing facial emotional expression, and again, we activate all this system, the mirror neuron areas, the limbic system, but the key thing is that these kids spend two days with us, and we do a lot of different things, and we collect also behavioral data. We know how socially competent they are. We know how empathic they are. And what we find is that when they are in the scanner and they're watching uh, facial emotional expression or imitating them, the activity in this brain...
the mirror neuron areas, and the emotional brain centers correlate with their social competence. The more competent they are socially, the more uh, empathic they are, the more active are these brain regions. So we think that this is really the beginning of getting a biomarker of social competence, which is a big deal. Now, let me give a little link to you know, some, the rest of this conference, which is all about uh, arts and literature and humanities. For some reason, I happen to have breakfast with Alberto almost every day, and we were talking about this stuff, and he told me, you know what, your work really reminds me of Canto 32 of Dante, and I thought, okay, an Argentinian Canadian guy has to tell me about Dante. I'm Italian, and I don't, don't know this stuff, even though I studied for many, many years. <laughs> so he has this beautiful passage in which um, Dante in the 32nd thir uh, Canto is uh, dealing with traders, and tra you don't see, you can't see the face of the traders, and Dante really shows a complete lack of empathy, and in a way we think that Dante Alighieri had actually captured just with his intuition as a writer, the notion that a way to um, shut down your capacity to empathize with your, uh, um, conspecific with, with other people, is to not look at them. I think that's something that probably we have in everyday experience, when, when we go out in the street and there is a homeless, we tend not to look at their face because that makes us sad in some way. So the face is really an important way of connecting with others and uh, to uh, empathize with them. But I also argue that it works the other way around. So this system is important for um, empathic connection, for understanding what's going on in the minds of others. But when it comes even to the aspect of fictional others, when you go and watch a movie or when you read a novel, the reason why we get so mesmerized by these stories is because we believe that in fact, and we're trying to do experiments on that, that in fact even by reading a novel you activate this system in the brain that lets you connect with people. And you empathize with somebody that doesn't really exist, you know it's a fictional character. But that's actually the way you, are, you get into the story and you actually learn through that. Okay, let me get to the final two parts of my talk. One of the slogans I have is that mirrors are good for you. So when we started working on this, we thought, okay, if this system is very important for social competence, as we claim and believe, then people that have social problems should also have some dysfunction in this system. And earlier on, there was this hypothesis that, in fact, there may be broken mirrors in autism. Patients with autism have really difficulty in interacting with other people. For them, it's problematic to, to have social interactions. And this is one of the studies we made. Other groups have done the same. Um, the bottom line is that in this study, we had two groups, typically developing kids and kids with autism. And they were doing our typical task, imitation and observation of facial emotional expression. And we found that the two groups differ significantly, especially at the bottom, you'll see those red blobs, exactly in those areas in the frontal lobe that contain mirror neurons, with much more reduced activity in the patients with autism. Importantly, we also found that there was a correlation between the reduced activity in, uh, in the patients and the severity of the disease. The more broken were the mirrors, the more impaired were, was the child. So this is an important clinical application that also has uh, inspired intervention that are based on imitation very early on in life in children with autism. And it seems that these interventions don't just help the social aspect, but even other things like language. Another immediate application when it comes to um, the mirroring discovery is motor recovery. If I, by just by looking at actions of others, my motor system gets activated, can we use this uh, action observation treatment as a form of physical therapy in some way? Of course, when you have a patient with brain damage, they have to go through the physical aspect of the, the therapy to recover motor function. But they can't do that all day, especially the patients that are more impaired. One thing that they can easily do is just by sit in front of a TV and watch repeatedly action that they're not able to do. There are data that suggest that by doing that, you improve the capacity of motor recovery in patients with brain damage. So these are two immediate applications that many groups have actually uh, implemented and are doing active studies on this. Now, in the last part of the talk, I want to talk about the things that get me very excited for the future. I'm a scientist, and it's always cool to have a discovery. And in fact, you know, one of 
the things about being a scientist that you know you can spend a whole life with no discoveries. Real discoveries are really rare to come by. And yet you're so an optimist. You always go to the lab and you... you and I think that's the other beautiful aspect of science, such an optimistic activity. But when you do have a discovery, you don't want to sit there. You find, that you find something you didn't know, and then the question is, what lays ahead? What is the new thing? How can I actually expand on this knowledge? And that's what we do all the time. Um, so one thing we're trying to figure out, I made an argument that this system is very, fairly automatic. I watch your action, and I can't help it. My mirror neurons will fire up. But is there a way we can control it? Of course there must be a way. Otherwise, we, you were imitating me all the time, which would be very funny, actually. Um, there's plenty of evidence, as I told you, that humans tend to imitate uh, automatically other people. There's also evidence from neurological literature that some brain damage produce what is called imitative behavior. In some cases, totally dysfunctional. That is, these patients, they, they can't help it. Whatever you do in front of them, they will imitate it. And if you look at the right side, the patient in front of the, uh, the, the doctor is wearing glasses. There are glasses on the desk, the doctor wears glasses, and the patient is trying to put a new pair of glasses on top of his own glasses. So clearly these data show that the, the lesions have, uh, uh, has probably damaged this control system, and they have this completely pathological imitative behavior. And what we're trying to do is to figure out exactly how the, the imitation control works used in brain imaging. I'm not going to show you any data, but our thinking right now is that there are two main kinds of uh, uh, imitative control. One it is reactive, I see you and I don't do what you're doing. One it is proactive in a way, in which you try to control your tendency to imitate when you know that you're going to go in certain situation. And this is, is an immediate application. Uh, the application is about um, drug abuse or substance abuse in general. Patients that uh, have a problem with, say, addiction with alcohol or drugs, and they go through rehab, these are, rehab programs are very expensive and they are lengthy, and they get out of the, the program, they are completely clean, they, you know, say, a heavy uh, alcohol drinker doesn't drink anymore. If you look at the series of these patients, about a year later, 50 to 70 percent relapse in the addiction. This is really a bad stat because these programs are very expensive and after a year, these guys go back to the vice. Well, it turns out that one of the main um, factors that lead them to go back to drink again or to drugs again are what, is called, what we call social cues. That is, I was a heavy drinker and I go out with a friend of mine and we go to a bar, I see him drinking and I get the cue of drinking and then I relapse. In this particular case, it would be really nice to improve control such that you reduce your tendency to mirror. But the other thing you can do whether, when you really understand how control and mirroring works is to increase empathy. We, just, we have the project that just got funded by NIH with the idea is that we have these two levels, the low level, the automatic level, and the, the higher level, the control level. We think that these two things are actually interrelated, and what we're trying to do is to figure out how to modulate these two phenomena. One way we conceptualize this is uh, by looking at what are called economic games, that is the tendency of people of sharing certain amounts of money, and that's a, a good uh, probe of some sort of uh, pro-social behavior that is fairly deliberate. It's not something automatic. And we're trying to manipulate the various levels, the control levels and the mirroring level to see whether we can actually affect even deliberate decisions about sharing things. I'm very excited about this project. Uh, the last two things I want to uh, tell you about projects we have going on right now in the lab. One is about body language and much more abstract kind of things. We use the body all the time, even when we're trying to convey very complex behaviors. I guess Italians do it more than others. This project, what we're trying to figure out is whether using the body helps concept formation. And there's plenty of data in the education literature and in the current literature that suggests that concept formation is a multimodal process. It requires the blending of different aspects of the, the information you try to, um, to make a concept about. So we do a study, we're not doing studies on kindergartens, we're doing studies actually on college students. These are UCLA students, they're pretty smart kids, their average GPA is very high. And yet when it comes to, say, teaching aspects of technology, like, for instance, how the internet works, if you teach in the classical way, which is pretty much the kind of stuff I'm doing now, 
they, some they get it, some they get it less. But if you actually teach them by using, by, by in, um, inspiring them or inviting them to use the body to mimic what they're listening to, it turns out that there is much better learning. And there are dramatic changes at the level of the brain. We just started this project with a small seed grant and we hope to get a much larger grant because if we're actually able to collect this kind of data, we can completely revolutionize the way we, in, we, we teach the way pedagogy is, uh, is actually organized. And this is a novel job to Fabiana. We're even doing a project on music and empathy. Um, one of my grad students is, a, is actually a musicologist, and he came to me with the idea, the way we like music is because we embody it. And so what we do is that through mirror neurons, when we listen to a piece of music, if we are not musicians, we embody probably with our voice only, with our mouth, basically. But if we are musicians, we, we can even simulate all the kinds of action that we do when we actually play the instrument. And so we're doing a project in which we're looking at how liking music and musical expertise change the way you actually, uh, the brain responds to, uh, to music. The last two slides, one, it's really... Um, I would say it's a dedication to the notion of doing interdisciplinary work. And then interdisciplinary work with many different kinds of people. But I guess the most outlandish in some way is this collaboration with uh, lovely Deborah Jensen. She's a professor in French literature at Duke University. And she's always been interested in mimesis. And so she contacted me for my work in mirror neurons and we started collaborating. And we even wrote a couple of papers together. One day she emailed me this thing, and as soon as I read it, I thought, Deborah, I got to quote you on this. Um, she says, a nearly simultaneous cellular limitation allows us to integrate the other's activity into our own embodied mind. Mirror neurons suggest a kind of ontological priority of representation, contrasting with millennia of conceptualizations of representation as physically external. What does, it, what does she mean? I mean, this is something that is so entrenched in us and goes back to Plato's cave. The whole idea is that what the mind does, there is a word out there, and we represent the word in our mind. She's saying, wait a minute, you guys discovered that the same cell that you used to grab a cup of coffee also fire up when you're seeing me grabbing a cup of coffee. Maybe we have to completely change this platonic idea that we, the mind represents the outside world. Maybe what we call representation, probably we should abandon the name because it frames the mind in the wrong way. It's something that has ontological priority. And this is something, a concept that it seems to me that if you just think about it, it's so groundbreaking. Okay, last slide so that we can actually have also some time for a few questions. First of all, if you want to know more about what we do in my lab, go to the website and you'll find different kinds of information. Uh, you can even download papers that we have published. But the two main uh, points I want to make is that we have this system in the brain that evolution has probably selected because it makes social interaction easy and because it helps learning. And the other point I want to make, general point, is that I think that even though the discovery is very, very cool, the legacy of this discovery, it's mostly about its application. It's pretty much like, if you think about it, it's pretty much like DNA. DNA was discovered about 60 years ago, and it was a groundbreaking discovery. But after all, the real cool thing about DNA is what's happening now. You can sequence your genome in for $1,000, but that's not the main point. The main point is that eventually we will be able to do personalized medicine. The fact that drugs work for some people but not others is because each one of us has a different genetic endowment. And by really using DNA um, technology, we can figure out exactly what is necessary for each individual. And by the same token, the kind of discovery we made with mirror neurons and the applications that we're trying to make, I think that eventually will lead to a much more empathic society and much more uh, uh, a society in which you know, things like social cues that are negative, like for instance, being exposed to violence leads to imitated violence, or being exposed to substance abuse tends uh, to, to make people more uh, prone to, to do substance abuse. We can control those things. And that's my message of hope for all of you. Thank you.